Hello and welcome to Shnai Mikra. I'm your host, Rabbi Batsal Edwards. We're going to skip to Yom Revi'i and someday, maybe, or maybe not, go back and do the other missing aliyahs. We are doing Parshat Mitzora. Parshat Mitzora, the fourth aliyah. Today is the fifth day of Nisan. <coughs> Verse, where, this is the book of Leviticus, chapter whatever, verse 23. By the bear of the Nile, Moshe Vel Aron Le Mohor, by the bear of the Nile, Moshe Vel Aron Le Mohor, and Moses and, and God spoke to Moses and to Aaron to say, Ki Tavo El Eretz Knaan, Esharni, no ten chem la achuzav, and atati negatsarad, bevet Eretz achuzatchem. Ki tavo el eretz knan esher ni no ten lechem lachuzah v'natati neged sarad bevet achuzat bevet eretz achuzat chem. Rashi says, and I oh that means if when you come to the land of Canaan which I give to you as an inheritance. It doesn't say inheritance. It says as a place to live place to hold on to, a holding, and I shall place the leprosy in the houses, in the houses of your properties, in the houses in the land of your holdings, literally. Rashi says, I have placed the, the affliction of leprosy in your houses. This is an announcement that the afflictions are going to come upon the children of Israel. Bear in mind, this is all being said in the desert before entering the land. Because the Emirates who were previously in the land hid their treasures, their gold and their silver in the walls of the houses. The whole 40 years that Israel was in the desert, apparently they were afraid that the Israelites would come and conquer their land, uh, which they did, we did, and uh, and by means of the affliction and the walls, it signified when we when we were the part of the purification of the affliction of leprosy for the walls of the houses was taking breaking down the walls and taking out the stones. And we, we saw the affliction and we went and we wanted to purify the houses and we found lots of money. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, the um, Admor of Lubavitch, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, may his merit protect us, said the following words about this verse. He said, uh, and I will place the affliction of leprosy, chapter 14, verse 24. We are in Leviticus 14. If you want to look it up at home on your computer screen or your family Bible that um, the Emirates hid their, then the Rashi says how the Emirates hid the treasures, that the uh, the afflictions appeared in the houses of the Emirates, that, that actually, specifically, in the homes of the Emirates, that, that hints at evil speech. Because we know that afflictions, skin afflictions, and afflictions on the home, come about through evil speech, la shanhara. Saying anything bad about anybody else for no good reason. That's got to be a very specifically defined good reason as defined in the halakha. Uh, the Chafetz Chaim's Shmira Talashon, guard thy tongue in English, gives you many examples of exactly when you could say something that is, is not a positive thing. Um, usually you can't. You do everything to avoid it. And uh, there's a lot of punishment. Uh, and evil speech basically messes up society. It just makes makes sense that when you say bad things about each other, it, do, it doesn't help anything. It only hurts. Um, so it's a very serious point of Jewish law. We're not supposed to speak evil of one another. Um, so that um, 
that the the houses these houses were afflicted with leprosy because of evil speech. So Rashi, so the Baba Chirebbe says, the Baba Chirebbe says that that it's actually it's specifically in, in, it's in these houses in particular that we are treasures inside of them. Because somebody who, who has the power of evil speech could channel that power of speech into good speech, into holy speech. So, so let's say somebody is a gossip, or somebody's always saying, so they, and they, they, they get to an advanced level, a PhD in gossip or a PhD in, in, in giving bad reports about other people. They could take that same energy and channel it into holy. They could become the holiest speaker in the world. Just have to re channel the energy. That's why, so that's so, it's like it says, I have taken from the Emirates with my sword and my bow. Jacob said this when on, on his deathbed. Uh, Jacob, who didn't die, said this on his deathbed that he has taken um, uh, the, the land of Israel from the Emirates with his sword and his, and his, and his bow and arrow. So to take it from the Emory, now Emory. I mean, it doesn't the Emirate? I never thought of this. Um, this is uh, that's why we have a Rebbe to, to show us new ideas and great great rabbis and great Rebbe's, not just a great comment. And a Rebbe is not just a commentator. The Rebbe is a, a spiritual leader and a spiritual light to fix his people's souls, but the um, and, and, and unites heaven and earth. But 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 in terms of just a great commentator who can point something out. Emorite, the word Emorites comes from the same root as the word for saying, Emor. So what's the connection? The Lubavitch Rebbe seizes on this connection. He says that we take from the Emorites, meaning speech, the power of speech, and they were using it for bad, and we're, we're using it for Torah and for prayer, for davening. That's... Um, that's why the that's why we tr the, the translation of uh, of what what does it mean with my sword and my bow? It's uh, that that, that uh, I've taken from the Emirates with my sword and my bow. The sword has to do is translated by Unclus as Torah, and the bow he translates as prayer. So I take it from the Emirates from the power of Lashon Hara and I put it into prayer and learning Torah, two mitzvahs that you need the mouth for. Verse 25. Uva asher lo babahit v'higid la kohen lemor kanega nir ali babahit And he brings that which um, is in his house and he And he goes to the priest and he says to him, I think I saw a leprous affliction in my house. Could you come and straighten it up? So Rashi says, it's like a nega, like an affliction. I saw something like an affliction. Something like an affliction appeared on my house. So Rashi says that even a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, who knows that it's, it is a bona fide affliction, he should not say that I saw an affliction on my house. He'll say, I saw something that looks like an affliction on my house. Why? Because if, uh, first of all, there's certain reasons that Rashi doesn't say here off the top of my head. It's only if, if he, uh, first of all, the, he can only be treated by a Kohen. doesn't matter if he's the biggest Talmud Chacham in the world. The purification only comes from the time the Kohen declares it impure. Even if he's the huge Talmud Chacham and the Kohen is a simpleton, this Kohen, the simple Kohen, can declare it um, impure. And the, and the big Talmud Chacham, the big Torah scholar, cannot. The power of the Kohen that is given by God. And the other thing is, if he, if if the Talmud Chacham were have the to have the power to declare it unclean, maybe he wouldn't have time to save things from his house that he could take out before it's declared unclean. He can remove things from his house, and they will not have they only will contract or contact ritual impurity once the coin declares it impure. 
Before that, nothing becomes impure. Chap verse 36. <speaking in Hebrew> And the Kohen shall command and to that the house be be emptied before he comes to see the affliction, like we said before, and, and it shall not become impure. So so the things that are taken out will not become impure. And afterwards the coin will go and see the house. Rashi says before the coin comes, because all the while that the coin uh, it does uh, that the coin does not declare it impure, there's no impurity, like I said before. Um and nothing in the house shall become impure. So the Torah Kohanim says if uh, if he didn't remove the stuff from the house and the coin comes and he sees the nega, then he's going to have to close everything and everything in it's going to become impure. So what is the Torah? It's the Rashi axes the question. Well, sometimes usually he asks. If it's a particularly brutal question, he may ask it. So he axes the question. Is this a brutal question? You decide. I don't even know what he's going to ask. Um, enough silly word games. So what is the Torah taking pity on? If if it was if he was taking pity on metal objects, on metal utensils, metal utensils can become purified in a, in a mikveh with with with, a, with water. If we're talking about food and drink, he could be they, if he's if the person is impure. Uh, they, he could eat them, and well, he's impure because an impure person can eat impure things. But so the Torah is how it takes pity on earthenware vessels that cannot become purified in a mikveh. So. The, the, the Medrash t talks about how if the Torah takes such pity on earthenware vessels, which are not, are not very, very ex if God if, if God takes pity on the least expensive, the least valuable vessels a person has, earthenware stuff, clay pots and clay cups and so forth, then all the more so, a fortiori, that God takes pity on a human being. If God takes pity on, on, on insignificant utensils at home that are not insignificant completely, but very cheap. So God, how much more so? How much more so does he take pity on a human being? And if he takes pity on a, on a, on a, on a wicked person's vessels, so the person might be a wicked person, but they could still have, God is still saving his vessels. So how much more so would he, would he, and he, Take pity if he takes pity on a wicked person, then how much more so does God take pity on a righteous person? Verse Lamed Zion 37. <speaking in Hebrew> Rashi says, what is the word? Okay, and he saw the affliction, and behold, uh, there is an affliction in the walls of the house. Shekaarurot, uh, Rashi says, that they're deep um, sunk sunken into the the wall. Shokot the color is deep within the wall. It's not just an external color, 
but it's 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 soaked in. So the sunk say say there's an affliction in the there's a sunk the affliction in the walls of the house is seeped in, whether it's dark green or dark red. And their appearance is deeper than the wall. Verse 38. And the coin shall go out of the house to the entrance of the house, and he shall close the house for seven days. Veshava kohen ba yom ashvii v'ravine pasah nega bekirot abayit veshava kohen ba yom ashvii v'ravine pasah nega bekirot abayit and the coin shall come back to the house on the seventh day and he shall see and behold the affliction has spread in the walls of the house. Betziva hakohein vechiltsu et havanim asher behena naga asher behena naga vehi shlichu eten el nichutz la ir el makom tamei betziva hakohein vechiltsu et havanim asher behena naga vehi shlichu eten el nichutz la ir el makom tamei and the coin shall command that the walls that the stones be removed uh, from, released from the wall um, that has the affliction and they shall be taken outside of the city to a to an impure place. It shall take out the stones as the, the translation of the, the art, like the, the word for chiltsu. The chaletz is to, to remove something, to d extract. The wood stones shall be extracted from the wall. It's the modern Hebrew translation. Rashi bases it on his his understanding on the onkelis, which says, vishalfun, vishlof, is to uh, take out. Yitzlum, to take them from there. To, to extract is a decent word. So as it is said in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, like you shall remove his shoe when it's talking about the Leveritic marriage or the, uh, the uh, chalitza ceremony. It has to do with removal. El makom tame to an impure place, a place uh, that's not used for pure things. This teaches that the stones... Um, will make something else impure in their place. Ve'et ha'bayit yaksia mi bayit savi ve'yishavchu et ha'afar asher aksu et el nichutz la'ir and the the house should be uh, separated from the near the adjoining house and the the uh, the dirt the the millet or the 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 dirt in between the uh, Stones um, that shall be taken and put aside, set aside outside of the city in an impure place. Yaksia, Rashi says, um, Yaksia means uh, it's it's used a lot in the Mishnah. Means to set aside a place. Mibayit from here. Mibayit. Oh, sorry, sorry. It means from from within. So et bayit yaksia mi bayit saviv. So from the inside, it should you have to not just take out the rocks, but also take out the dirt. Veshavchot uh, afar, and then take the mi bayit from the inside and around. Rashi says around. Also the take out the stones and the dirt around 
the affliction around the leprous spot in the house. And the Taurus Kohanim explains this, that he has to scrape the uh, millet around the stones of the uh, affliction. Hiksu, Rashi says it has to do with the word katse, the edge, ends, the edges, the, the extremities. The, around the affliction he has to clean uh, at the edges. So, v'lakhu avanim v'acherot v'heviu el tachat avanim v'afarachet er yikach v'tachat abarit v'lakhu avanim acherot v'heviu el tachat avanim v'afarachet er yikach v'tachat abarit He shall take other stones and bring them underneath the, these stones and an other earth he shall take and he shall uh, plaster the house. V'im yashu v'nega u'farach Babahid achar kilets et avanim, va achare hixot et abayet, va achare hitoach. And if the, if the leprous spot shall come back and spread in the house after he removed the stones and after he had set aside the house and after he had plastered it, hixot, Rashi says, this to be done. Um, set aside, here he says, something that is done. Also, the word for plaster. But, chiletzat of a name, to remove the stones, goes back on the person who is doing the removal. That's, um, it's a Lushan Kaved, it's a heavy, heavy, heavy form of grammar, like kiper, diber, chiletz. It's a, that's, that's called the heavy Lashon uh, Kaved, which what exactly that means, you can ask a grammarian. The Im Yashuv Nega, and if the affliction shall come back, it could come back that day. If it comes back that very day, is it still impure? So the Torah says, Veshava Koyin, the coin has to come back. And then it says, and if he comes back, so the same way that we're coming back, uh, that said at the end of the week, it's so to the coming back, which is said here at the first week. So the answer is no. Um, then he has to wait a week. Uva hakohen v'ra'a v'inei pasah nega v'bayet v'tsarat mamaret hi v'bayet tamehu and the coin shall come and see, and behold, if the leprous spot has spread in the house, it is bona fide leprosy, the house is impure. Could, and so there's a very long Rashi here, which I'm going to skip. And he shall break the down, the house shall be broken down, the stones and its wood and every, all the all the, the earth in the walls, and it should be take everything will be taken outside of the city into an impure place. And anyone coming to the house all the days that it's closed will become impure until the night. This Rashi says, all the days when he's closed, but not the days when the, the leprosy was scraped. Could it be that I set aside that, we, that the verse is, is excluding the, the declare, declaration of permanent leprosy when, that, that he, when he scraped the house? So the Talmud says all of the days. 
Taurus says all of the days. I don't understand that. Yitzmah, the Arif will become impure until the night. That comes to teach us that it does not make clothing impure. Could it be that does he have to stay as long as it takes to eat a slice of bread? Uh, sorry, a half a loaf of bread. Uh, the time it takes to eat a half a loaf of bread, I don't know, what is that? Five minutes, ten minutes? There's a certain amount of time, five or ten minutes, called as long as Kedeachilat Pras, as long as it takes to eat half a loaf of bread, that that's the duration of time he has to spend in the house to become impure. So does he need to stay that long? So the Torah says, though anyone who eats in the house will wash his clothing. So that's true for clothing. So his clothing become impure. But uh, what about somebody who lies down in the house? So the Torah says, and somebody who lies down. So we only have eating and lying down in the house. What if he didn't eat or didn't lie down in the house? So the Torah says, Yechabes, Yechabes. It says twice, he shall wash. He shall wash. That comes to include something else. If so, why doesn't it say eating and lying down? That's an, the reason why it doesn't say that is to give a measurement for how long it takes to lie, that you need to lie down, and that you need to lie down for the time it takes to eat half a loaf of bread. Which is, however many minutes your rabbi says it is. Somebody who lies down in the house shall wash his clothing, and someone who eats in the house shall wash his clothing. Washing, again, refers to immersing in a kosher mikvah. If the Kohen shall surely come and see that behold and behold the the affliction has not spread in the house after he be plastered the house and he, the Kohen um, shall pronounce the house uh, clean, pure, because the affliction has been healed. And, and he shall take in order to purify the house uh, two birds and cedar wood, scarlet and hyssop. And he shall slaughter the bird, the one of the birds, over an earthenware vessel over living water. and he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the bird and the living bird and he shall immerse them 
in blood, uh, the blood of the burst them in the blood of the bird that is slaughtered, and in the living water, and he shall sprinkle on the house seven times from the this mixture. You shall purify the house with the blood of the bird and with the living water and with the, li the living bird and the with and with the living bird and the blood of the bird and the living water and with the living bird and the cedar wood and the myr and the myrtle and with the scarlet and he shall send the living bird outside of the city onto the fields to fly away, and the house will, shall be atoned for and is and shall be pure. V'zot ha-Torah kol nega ha-Tzarat v'lanatek.